Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be looking at the concept of atomic emission spectroscopy, a technique that forensic scientists can use to identify the elements present in the sample. Well, let's start with a bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to look at how one different particular element can give off um, coloured light, and specifically looking at how it can give off multiple colours of light. We're then going to look at well, how can um, how do elements form emission spectra? How do they form absorption spectra? And what's the wash up in, you know, of us in being able to use these in forensic science? So what applications are there for us to use this technique? Okay, so let's have a look at why um, atoms of a particular element give off multiple colours. Okay, so remember that in most atoms, everything but hydrogen, there are multiple electrons, two or more. Um, and, you know, certainly as we get to larger and larger atoms, you know, like gold has 79, you know, that uranium would have 92, for example, that, that, that we get lots of different electrons going on there. And the idea is that each electron can make multiple possible transitions. Okay, so um, depending on how much energy is absorbed or emitted, um, and then when you add more and more electrons into the atom, that then you've got lots of different possibilities that can be going on. And each transition, each jump that that electron could make has its own characteristic wavelength of light that will be given off as it drops back down, because that corresponds to a different energy gap for each transition. So we've got lots of multiple electrons with multiple possible transitions, each with their own characteristic wavelength, and so therefore we get simultaneous emission of several different colours of light. Now not every infinite possibility, because the electrons can only go to certain places, and certain energy levels, but we do have multiple possibilities, okay, that gives us um, a series of colours. And that's where the value comes in for this, for the, uh, uh, as an application in atomic emission spectroscopy, because we can collect together, um, we can get gaseous samples of a range of different elements, metals and non-metals, and we can place them in, in an electrical discharge, so connect them up to an electric circuit, and they will give off light of particular colours. And so the colour, the colours that are given off, looking for a range of wavelengths for a particular, um, for any given element, we call its line emission spectrum. Okay, so we're seeing lines of particular colours, you know, so looking at mercury up the top here, so seeing that we've got, you know, some kind of dark, kind of purple and blue, green, a series in yellow, an orange, and then kind of this, this purpley, kind of pinky red sort of colour. So seeing that then they combine together, you would observe only a single colour with your eyes when you see a sample of mercury um, be illuminated, but that if we use um, technique, technology like a spectroscope, for example, that we can observe the range of different colours here. So then that's particularly useful for us with this technique because we can see that these different elements don't have this identical spectra. Now we're all looking at the same wavelengths, like the same kind of scales, but each element gives off different colours. And so that's where the value comes in at being able to identify particular elements. Now we've already looked in the past at the idea of atomic absorption spectroscopy, looking at absorbing particular wavelengths, but the idea is that you can see how this, this is connected, that we get a, get a continuous kind of spectrum or the, the full kind of rainbow, that when we're exciting the atoms that we can get particular wavelengths being emitted, but also we can recognise that that atoms of that element will absorb those same wavelengths from white light. So um, in astronomy, for example, we can look at an absorption spectrum and say, look at, okay, well, what, um, what colours are being absorbed by atoms of hydrogen and helium and, you know, carbon and oxygen? Um, and so we can look at them more as finding the gaps rather than finding the coloured emission lines. Okay, but in this, this case, we're only really focusing on how the emission spectrum can help us in a forensic context. So why would we bother? What's the value in this technique? Okay, the, the reason is that emission and absorption spectra are characteristic for a given element. So a mercury atom will always give off the same type of emission spectrum, which will be different to a chlorine atom, which will be different to a hydrogen and a helium, a nitrogen, um, all these different elements will give off their own characteristic spectrum. So that means that if we subject a sample to, um, you know, to, to the conditions where we will get uh, an emission spectrum, we can use it to identify the elements that are present in the sample. But um, there's a few kind of things that, that qualify that. 
the first thing is that it's most useful for metals and then inorganic compounds. Okay, so we, we've seen in the past that metals are most applicable to these sort of techniques, um, but um, that it can you know work with with nonmetals as well, but also in um, inorganic compounds. But the the reality is that when we're only looking at what elements are there, it can't identify what compound it is. It can't identify how its bonding is put together, what its 3D molecular structure is, you know, how are those atoms connected together. Um, it can't give us any of that information. It can just tell us that there's sodium and there's chlorine, or that there's carbon and there's oxygen. But it can't tell us whether it's carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, for example. And that also means that then it's not very useful for organic compounds, because you think about it, that Hydrocarbons are made up of largely the same elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur. So being told that a compound contains one or more of those elements isn't really giving you much useful information, okay? Because you kind of knew that already. But the way that those atoms are connected together is what gives it its characteristic properties and distinguishes an alkane from an alkene from an alkanol, okay? Um, so it's only that's why it's only particularly useful for inorganic compounds or identifying um, heavy metals, for example, or trace metals. And it's also um, a qualitative technique, okay, so that it, um, you can't, we, we're, we're only looking at, okay, what wavelengths are present or not present, um, not, okay, well, what's the, you know, exactly how much light is being given off, okay, that it can't, um, in, in, this, in this sort of technique, that that's not what we're doing. Now, with atomic absorption spectroscopy, that we look, we can actually then say, right, we'll prepare standards and we can look at how much light is absorbed and then we can, you know, construct a calibration line and all those sorts of things to quantify it, okay? But this technique doesn't, doesn't work that way, okay? Um, but so here's kind of an example of how it could be, prove useful. So looking at a sample of pottery, looking at the emission spectrum given off by the pottery, and then comparing it with element, you know, particular elements and then identifying what elements are present in the pottery based on comparing them with the emission spectra of these elements and identifying that we have copper and we have mercury. So you can see that the copper lines are highlighted in red in the top kind of area, and then the mercury ones are circled in blue. And so seeing that, you know, this is one of the practice examples you've got. So seeing that then we can, we can conclude that the pottery contains these elements and likewise that it doesn't contain calcium, chromium, or iron because those wavelengths are absent. So this has some, you know, has, has uses forensically in thinking about, you know, looking at pollution, uh, particularly if we want to focus on trace elements or heavy metals that might be present in, say, a water sample um, or, a, you know, a soil sample is where it also is, can be quite useful um, because then we can, we, can, um, we can analyze the sample using this technique and we can identify by the wavelengths that are given off what elements are present and we can compare them with these known standards. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.